Hi friends, so today we are going to discuss about non-invasive ventilation. We are going to discuss about the indications, contraindications of non-invasive ventilations. We are going to discuss about what is BiPAP, what is CPAP uh, and in detail we are going to discuss about the role of non-invasive ventilation in acute exacerbation of COPD and acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So uh, this is the general overview uh, and in the end of course we are going to also discuss uh, how to apply non-invasive ventilation, how to begin with and what are the things to consider in these particular situations. So let's start with the indications of non-invasive ventilation and as you can see on your screen the indications can be broadly divided into hypoxemic respiratory failure and hypercarbic respiratory failure. Uh, now hypoxic respiratory failure as you know uh, the level 1 indication level 1 means there are multiple uh, randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis suggesting that uh, there is benefit uh, in using uh, non-invasive ventilation for this indication so this level 1 indication is uh, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema uh, the other indications so immunocompromised patients uh, who are having pneumonia or other respiratory infections that is also one of the uh, important indication but it is not level 1 indication and uh, other indications like asthma, pneumonia, ARDS for bronchoscopy, for palliation uh, in case of chest trauma sometimes we need to use. So these are the other indications and we might uh, discuss a little bit at the end. Uh, coming to the hypercapnic respiratory failure so as you know acute exacerbation of COPD is the level 1 indication here. Uh, if you use non-invasive ventilation timely, you can significantly reduce the rate of reintubation and mortality in these patients. Uh, there is also a role uh, for non-invasive ventilation post-extubation in patients of COPD or those who are likely to uh, get reintubated because of uh, respiratory failure. So that is also a, a reasonable indication and sometimes for neuromuscular conditions, uh, non-invasive ventilation may be used to assist the uh, ventilation. So these are broadly the indications for non-invasive ventilation. Now what are the contraindications? So uh, in any condition, even if it fits uh, into the indication, uh, if the patient has concerns regarding airway protection, uh, then that's not a good indication to go ahead and uh, it becomes a contraindication. So these patients are those with uh, low GCS, uncooperative patients or patients uh, who are undergoing cardiac arrest and CPR or patients who are uh, having seizures not easily controllable. So probably better to intubate these patients rather than attempting non-invasive ventilation. Uh, those patients who have facial deformities uh, because of various pathologies or surgery or trauma, uh, the interface, the fitting will not be proper and there will be problem. So uh, they are also not good candidates for non-invasive ventilation. Uh, those with hemodynamic instability, generally the uh, more than one inotrope, more than moderate dose uh, of inotropes, probably not a good uh, patient to start non-invasive ventilation. As a general rule, uh, obviously the patient will have respiratory failure. So as a general rule, if the patient has more than one organ dysfunction, uh, except for, uh, apart from respiratory failure, uh, probably we would not use non-invasive ventilation in those patients because they are too unstable and they may deteriorate or have a respiratory or cardiac arrest very soon. So rather we would intubate those patients. So uh, that's a good good way to remember it. Uh, those who are at a risk of aspiration, like those who are continuously having nausea, vomiting, or those having excessive secretions, probably uh, not good candidates for uh, non-invasive ventilation. And uh, recent upper airway or upper gastrointestinal surgeries, generally up to duodenum, and they are also not good uh, candidates because there is some aer aerophagia, uh, there is some uh, pressure in the upper airways, and it may not be. Uh, uh, very very good situation to be in. So these are the uh, contraindications for non-invasive ventilation. Now uh, we need to also uh, know what are the problems uh, in various groups. So we will discuss broadly two groups. One is hypercapnic and the other is hypoxic and the uh, strongest indication for hypercapnic is COPD. So what are the problems in COPD uh, and why do we need to think about uh, ventilation at all. So uh, there are three main problems. Uh, first of all there is uh, narrowing of the airway because of the obstructive airway disease. Generally this is because of the excessive uh, secretions and uh, smooth muscle hypertrophy. The second problem is there is destruction of the alveoli uh, like in emphysema which leads to uh, loss of their uh, quality to collapse, uh, the loss of their elastic recoil and uh, hyperinflation in these patients. Uh, 
so that's the second problem and the third is diaphragmatic dysfunction so when there is hyperinflation the diaphragm is compressed and uh, it undergoes atrophy over long time uh, there is limited excursion of the diaphragm to support ventilation and uh, the respiratory muscles are also uh, uh, facing a lot of uh, stress uh, because of the hyperinflated lungs and the above problems so these are the three main problems uh, in COPD patients now how your uh, NIV or BiPAP uh, especially uh, will be helpful so for obstructive airway disease uh, BiPAP will provide a stenting because of the continuous positive pressure so it may be CPAP or BiPAP but it will provide a positive pressure and that will be useful for these patients and it will uh, help maintain their airway uh, like a stent so the second problem that we had was alveolar destruction because of the uh, for example emphysema so uh, when you apply uh, epap to these patients uh, it will act as an opposite force to the intrinsic peep the intrinsic peep is the pressure generated inside the lungs because of the trapped air and uh, if the intrinsic peep is higher the patient has to overcome that peep to trigger a breath uh, when you apply bipap uh, and epap especially in these patients uh, the intrinsic peep is counteracted uh, with the epap and the patient's effort or the requirement of uh, work to generate a breath becomes less so that is the way uh, it is useful uh, to apply uh, bipap now the diaphragmatic dysfunction so whenever your patient uh, you apply uh, bipap if you use uh, timed mode so there is a fixed frequency of giving breaths if you give pressure support or ipap on top of epap that helps uh, a patient to take more tidal volume that helps diaphragm uh, that assists diaphragm to give certain number of breaths so whenever diaphragm is atrophied or hypertrophied uh, giving uh, manual breaths through the bipap or giving pressure support is helpful from that point of view so uh, as you understood uh, there are these are the various uh, ways uh, BiPAP or CPAP is helpful. Now, what are the indications uh, to start BiPAP in acute exacerbation of COPD? So, when the patient comes in acute exacerbation, patient is tachypneic, uh, the pH is less than 7.30 and pCO2 is more than 45 millimeters of mercury or 6.5 kilopascal. These are the patient who might benefit from uh, use of BiPAP. If, uh, say, your carbon dioxide pCO2 is elevated but the pH is compensated, Probably these patients are not the candidates for BiPAP. So you have and a patient should be in acute exacerbation. So these these uh, criteria should be fulfilled before you attempt to give BiPAP to the patients. So uh, that's about the COPD. Now we will also discuss about what happens in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So when the patient presents in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, there is generally heart failure, uh, predominantly left-sided failure, which results in uh, increased hydrostatic pressure and uh, the uh, pulmonary edema develops uh, this pulmonary edema also leads to dilution of the surfactants because the alveoli are filled with uh, fluid uh, and it dilutes the surfactants so the ability to uh, elastic recoil and uh, to, to, to uh, stay expanded is lost to some extent and this fluid filled alveoli ultimately uh, cannot take part in the air exchange this leads to development of shunt shunt is when the ventilation uh, does not take place but the blood is flowing so this uh, forms a shunt and eventually this become the patient becomes more and more hypoxic so uh, it's like a vicious circle so when you apply uh, niv in these patients we will discuss further what type of niv but when you apply niv in these patients it acts in at four levels so uh, straightforward when you give some positive pressure it helps to recruit the alveoli uh, which is straightforward since the alveoli are recruited more air can be accommodated so the functional residual capacity is uh, better uh, also since you have opened up the alveoli uh, they participate in gas exchange and thus the sh uh, shunt is also less the fourth uh, mechanism is when you give positive pressure ventilation it is helpful for the left ventricle uh, in this situation the left ventricle is failing and the positive pressure ventilation is helpful for uh, the left ventricle now uh, first three are very straightforward but the fourth one needs more explanation so for uh, understanding this thing you need to know cardio uh, pulmonary interaction or heart lung interaction so let's discuss that briefly uh, i will try to make a separate video on cardio pulmonary interaction to go in more detail but for now let's let's summarize it in a short uh, manner so what happens is normally when we spontaneously breathe the ventilation is negative pressure ventilation uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, at rest the pressure is uh, negative when you take breath and during inspiration the pressure becomes more negative this helps the uh, air from the atmosphere to come in and enter the thoracic cavity now when you give positive pressure ventilation what happens is there is positive pressure inside so the intrathoracic pressure or pleural pressure becomes positive this uh, positive pressure remains in the both the phases the uh, inspiratory phase as well as expiratory phase uh, during the positive pressure ventilation so this is very important to uh, understand so what happens when you give uh, positive pressure the intrapleural pressure increases the intrathoracic pressure increases so whatever blood is coming uh, from the periphery towards the right ventricle uh, has to uh, enter the thoracic cavity against a higher gradient so less blood less venous return comes back and the preload of the right ventricle becomes less uh, what happens after that since the preload is less the filling is less at the same time uh, the afterload is more uh, we will just discuss that uh, very soon but the afterload is also uh, more so the right ventricular stroke volume is impaired eventually the left ventricular filling is impaired uh, at the same time because of this high intrathoracic or intrapleural pressure the aorta is also uh, within this uh, space so aortic uh, barrel receptors get activated and there is reflex vasodilatation so for the left ventricle because of the vasodilatation the afterload becomes less so for the left ventricle if you see the filling is less so the preload is less and the afterload is also less so it is a good thing for the left ventricle at the same time uh, because of the compression uh, from uh, from the positive pressure applied there is more efficient emptying of the left ventricle so all these things lead to improvement in the left ventricular stroke volume now what happens to the right ventricular afterload we said we will discuss that very soon so uh, you need to also understand what is trans pulmonary pressure trans pulmonary pressure is difference of alveolar pressure minus pleural pressure so whenever you give positive pressure the trans pulmonary pressure also goes up so the right ventricle has to uh, pump the blood into the pulmonary vasculature which are facing high pressure so there is vasoconstriction because of hypoxia because of high pressure outside so the right ventricle afterload increases and the right ventricular uh, stroke volume also decreases because of that so eventually if you want to summarize in a nutshell giving positive pressure is good for the failing left ventricle positive pressure is not good for the right ventricle uh, opposite to that negative pressure or spontaneous breathing is good for the right ventricle spontaneous breathing is not good for the failing left ventricle i hope it is clear and i will try to make a separate video uh, about this and uh, try to explain this in more details now yeah another important question is uh, should we start cpap or bipap for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema uh, now as we discussed in acute exacerbation of copd bipap is more useful for those cases because you need a peep or epap as well as you need a pressure support or IPAP. Uh, for ca cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, there are various studies which compared CPAP and BiPAP and mm, did, not, did not have a really great uh, difference in outcome. However, uh, logically or physiologically, if you think, uh, BiPAP can reduce the work of uh, breathing, it can increase the tidal volume uh, uh, more uh, compared to the just the uh, EPAP or CPAP and uh, it improves the ventilation in patients with hypercarbia. So if given a choice, probably selecting BiPAP is more prudent even for uh, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So that's about how uh, non-invasive ventilation work in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And uh, also we have discussed uh, how does it work in uh, acute exacerbation of COPD. So now another important thing to uh, discuss is uh, how do you start an IV? So for example, if your patient is uh, having COPD exacerbation and uh, they are fulfilling the criteria to start an IV, what, what will you do? So first and foremost, explain the patient that you are going to start a therapy which might which is likely to benefit the patient. There will be a tight fitting mask around the nose and mouth or around the face and uh, the patient will have to be uh, kept on that mask and the machine. Uh, for most of the time. Uh, also explain that if this therapy fails, uh, you may need to intubate and uh, do invasive ventilation. Uh, keep the uh, invasive ventilation ready uh, in case you need it. Other thing is, uh, second thing is to choose an interface. So whether you need to uh, select a naso uh, oronasal mask or full face mask. Generally when we start for the first time, these are the two choices that we use. Uh, 
uh, Oro nasal has a less dead space, so I would probably prefer that. Uh, the third thing is which machine do you have? So sometimes we have a portable NIV machine, sometimes in the ICU we have the ICU ventilator. So depending on the machine, which mode you select will be dependent. So for example, if you have a portable NIV machine, you will have options to select whether a spontaneous mode or spontaneous time S oblique T mode. Uh, the difference is uh, in spontaneous time mode, you can select a backup uh, rate of ventilation. So that's uh, which mode to select. Uh, also, when you have a portable machine, generally you need to select oxygen in terms of liter rather than the fractional inspired oxygen concentration. So that is another difference. The third difference is in portable ventilators, you have the options to select uh, EPAP and IPAP when you select BiPAP ventilation. Uh, so EPAP stands for uh, expiratory positive airway pressure. IPAP stands for inspiratory positive airway pressure. Uh, now, if you compare this with the ICU ventilator, uh, generally the mode is NIV or NIVPC. NIVPC is pressure control NIV. So there also you select the backup rate. Uh, so that's a, a more controlled mode with non-invasive. Also, uh, instead of EPAP, you have to select PEEP. So PEEP and EPAP are effectively same. If your mode is CPAP, then PEEP, EPAP and CPAP, all three are same. Uh, and instead of inspiratory IPAP, here there is pressure support. So only difference is pressure support is always above PEEP uh, in a ICU ventilator. When, when, so you can remember that whenever there is pressure support, it is always above PEEP. Uh, so for example, if your EPAP, if your portable ventilator settings are IPAP of 10 and EPAP of 5, if you want to change this patient to, a, to an ICU uh, ventilator, probably the settings will have to be changed. So now instead of EPAP of 5, you will select PEEP of 5. Instead of IPAP of 10, you will have to select pressure support of 5. That is 10 minus 5. So 5 above PEEP. So technically during inspiration, the pressure will be 5 plus 5 that is PEEP plus 5 that is the pressure support. So the pressure will be 10, which is inspiratory positive. So technically it is all the same, but the nomenclature is little different. So you need to know that. Now, uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is what FIO2 to, to start. So generally for a COPD patient, we target a saturation of around 88-90%. So you can start with 1 or 2 liter oxygen on the portable machine or you can start with 25 or 30% oxygen FIO2 on the ICU uh, ventilator. So that's your FIO2. Now uh, you have to hold the mask on the patient's face uh, with a tight fitting and start with the EPAP of say uh, 4. Uh, generally we start between somewhere between 2 to 4 and IPAP uh, which is generally 4 cm more than the EPAP. So roughly uh, say you can start with the settings of EPAP of 4 and IPAP of 8 and you have to fit the mask tightly uh, 1 or 2 liters oxygen to target saturation of 88 to 92 percent. And now you have to stand with the patient when you are doing it for the first time to ensure that whatever patient uh, is triggering, each trigger is uh, converted into a ventilator breath. So for example, if you see that the patient is making such efforts, but the ventilation, the breath is not being delivered, those triggers are not effective. So that means the patient has more intrinsic PEEP and probably you need to go high on your EPAP. So go high on your EPAP by one, one centimeter of water uh, every, every uh, few seconds until each uh, trigger is uh, followed by a breath through the ventilator once you so that's your uh, epap or peep which you need to select and now your ipap will be by default it should be more than four centimeter above the peep or epap but at the same time you need to look at the tidal volume how much tidal volume the patient is generating and whether the patient is feeling comfortable so if you are satisfied with the tidal volume you can keep that difference of four if you are not satisfied you can increase the difference if you are if you feel that the tidal volume is very high you can rather come down also on the ipap uh, but obviously it will never be less than epap or less than peep because it is above the epap or peep so that you have to remember so that's the initial setting now uh, you need to monitor this patient when you have put the uh, non-invasive ventilation for the first time you have to monitor the vitals, the respiratory rate, the use of accessory muscles, patient's subjective uh, feeling, whether they are feeling better uh, after starting this and you need to monitor the arterial blood gas as well. You can repeat a blood gas generally after one hour or one and a half hour and uh, in any case if you feel that it is not working, uh, 
you can tweak the settings if the patient becomes unstable or patient's organ failures number of organs which are failing worsen you might need to cut short the trial and you might need to intubate these patients so uh, please keep that in mind so that is about the uh, initiation of uh, bipap in uh, your uh, acute exacerbation of copd now uh, we will also discuss what are the initial settings for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema so uh, generally we start with a peep of uh, 8 to 10 peep or epap of 8 to 10 for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema and uh, based on the response we uh, titrate it up or down uh, and the uh, pressure support or ipap is generally 4 cm above the epap so that's the general uh, setting for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You don't really need to look at the uh, trigger, whether the patient is triggering and whether the breaths are delivered because that is not the problem as we discussed in the uh, uh, problems uh, in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So that's about uh, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now, uh, I hope uh, that's very clear. Now, uh, we will also uh, briefly discuss about the other indications that we discussed in the beginning. So these other indications are uh, hypoxic patients who are immunocompromised who are having any respiratory infection these patients are generally having very high uh, oxygen demand and they are generally febrile or toxic uh, the only reason to not intubate these patients straight away is to prevent or to reduce the risk of developing nosocomial pneumonia because these are immunocompromised they are more prone to develop nosocomial infections and uh, their outcome may be worse so to, to prevent the uh, introduction of invasive uh, invasion of uh, microorganisms probably we try with non-invasive and if that fails then we go and uh, uh, intubate these patients uh, another indication as we discussed earlier is post extubation in those patients who are either COPD or those who are at risk of uh, developing respiratory failure and develop, uh, needing re-intubation so when you are anticipating that this patient may uh, go into respiratory failure for example COPD patient those patients who are on a very long term ventilation and who are likely to uh, fail the uh, extubation uh, because of prolonged uh, they, they cannot sustain prolonged uh, respiratory effort probably it is a good idea to start uh, non-invasive ventilation or BiPAP as soon as they are extubated the data shows that if you uh, start BiPAP after some time when they uh, already they are tired uh, the results are not as good so if you are anticipating that the, there is going to be a problem uh, start BiPAP as soon as you extubate these patients uh, the other indications uh, so in uh, acute exacerbation of asthma uh, BiPAP is not a first line uh, modality and uh, in very few cases if you are in the ICU and you are closely monitoring the patient you may try with uh, BiPAP especially in those who have asthma uh, which is converted into COPD or some patients but uh, or sometimes in you feel that it's an asthma but it is actually pulmonary edema so in those cases it might uh, retrospectively you may say that okay i applied bipap and it helped but uh, if it is a pure asthma and acute exacerbation bipap has very little role uh, for pneumonia which is unilateral bipap has very little role for ards bipap has some role uh, but uh, now we have uh, high flow nasal oxygen also so for pneumonia and for ards that is also a very good choice and probably it is uh, used in more uh, more commonly than the bipap to assist for bronchoscopy as a palliative measure uh, i don't think there is any need to uh, elaborate this further for chest trauma uh, giving positive pressure acts as a splint uh, prevents atelectasis and uh, helps control pain so uh, for that you can use bipap uh, in those situations so that's all about uh, use of bipap in icu uh, with more emphasis on acute exacerbation of copd and cardiogenic pulmonary edema I hope you have liked this video. Uh, please uh, hit like and subscribe to my channel for more such videos. Till then. Uh